Same thing here, if I change something in the, in the equation itself, that impact here, again, is multiplied by Q plus, but also by Q. Okay, that's the only difference. Here, it's just Q plus. Here, it's a scalar product between Q and Q plus. Okay? All right. So, adjoint variables carry information by themselves. You, can, you cannot just use them for, for, for um, um, uh, optimization. It's worth looking at them all by themselves in isolation and, and determine where in your flow do you have a sensitive area and where you don't. Okay? So, they carry information all by itself. That's very nice because with this additional information, with solving that additional um, that additional uh, equation for the adjoint, we get an enormous amount of uh, information that we didn't have before that doesn't come out of the first equation. Okay. And because of that one, we can ask very, very different and very complicated questions that are often not asked in stability theory if you do it the classical way. The classical way, you just care about thumbs up or thumbs down. It's a binary decision. Is it stable or not? Is the eigenvalue in the half plane that is unstable or the half plane that is stable? Here we can ask a little bit more intelligent questions. For example, what are the most stability sensitive areas in the flow? The adjoint will point, will point to that. Does the stability receptivity change as we change the equilibrium point, as we change the geometry? as we change a parameter. Is it getting better for higher Reynolds number or is it getting worse for higher Reynolds number? What effect does the Mach number have? All these things can be asked because we have gradient information. Okay? For another, for a standard stability analysis, you would have to do another calculation with a higher Mach number if you want to know whether it's getting better or worse for a higher Mach number. Here, we don't. And I'll show you examples where we can get actually parameter studies at almost no cost whatsoever, within reason. Okay? Also, another question that often comes up is, is if you have an instability and you actually see the mode that grows the most, okay, where the mode grows the most is not probably where it came from. It came from somewhere else, and by the time it grew to high amplitude, it already moved away from the origin of where it started. Okay? This technique with the sensitivity actually can tell us where the origin of an instability is. Okay? Or another way of saying that one, if I want to kill that instability, where should I kill it when it's still small? Okay? Where did it come from? Where can I sort of suffocate it while it's still developing? Okay, so for control purposes, this is very, very important information. And also, of course, where should we place control elements to efficiently manipulate the flow and many, many, many more. Okay, so this is the added value that we get. We can do a much, much more complex stability analysis or flow analysis. Uh, and eigenvalues and asymptotic tools that we had based on Lapunov just cannot do that. Now, okay, before I show you some, some examples, let me also say a, a few words about the computational details. Because I just threw out that math and say, here's the adjoint equation. Well, yeah, how, how do I get that, right? How, and, and, and if I do nonlinearities, you know, is there any other things I have to watch out for? So here's a little bit of, a, of an overview of what needs to be done to do this type of analysis in the modern way like I have in the title. Okay. So this is the system we have to solve, obviously. It's that iterative round and round and round thing where you have a simulation here, and then you have to solve the adjoint equation, then you have to solve the gradient, stick it into an optimization, do better next time, and then go around and around until you have what you want. Okay. So usually what we have is something for this, this is your code, okay? And it could be open foam, or it could be your, your, your self-knitted code, or something like that. It could be house code, le 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 legacy code, whatever you have, okay? So this is your code. This is what you probably don't have, or probably have not even thought about, okay? And this same for this one. The optimization, I, I assume you just take uh, something off the shelf, you know, BFGS or conjugate gradient or something like that. So the question is, 
how do we get these components to solve this equation in the best possible way? Okay. And one possibility, there's, there's, there's many possibilities, but one possibility is you sit down and you derive it. Okay? You take your equations and you just go through exactly that integration by parts to figure out what is this equation, this FDQ, how does that look like in my case? Now, if you have the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations for a simple geometry, that one has been done for you. Okay? There's plenty of papers out and you can even do it yourself for an afternoon and you're, you have it done. Okay? But if your F happens to be the compressible Navier-Stokes equation with reactive flows and non-equilibrium and multiphase and level sets, good luck with that one. Okay? You're going to be busy for the next two years and you better buy sheets and sheets of paper. Okay? So there has to be a little bit of a better way of getting these things from your code. Okay? Now, one thing, and then here is, here is how we do it. Okay? So... Um, one possibility that often comes up that people are probably familiar with is automatic differentiation. Okay, how many of you have heard of automatic differentiation? Very good. Okay, so automatic differentiation is a way of getting sensitivity information, getting the adjoint by going through your code and producing from your code another code that solves the adjoint equation. Okay, and it does that automatic as the name suggests. Suggests. Okay, so. Typical one, ADI4 is a package. Tapenad is a, ta a package that is quite good for, for, for these things. But the problem with, uh, with automatic differentiation is you send your code that is already big, like a compressible Navier-Stokes code with shock capturing and everything. Okay? And then the code that comes back after that software package works through all your subroutines is enormously inflated. Okay, and also is quite slow because of that. Okay, and if you look at it, what to to go through the code and actually learn what is it actually doing? It's a little bit like a black box. Okay, so we wanted to have something that is much leaner and something that we can actually do fairly easily with our code. Okay, so the FDQ, this thing here, as we know, that's the Jacobian. Okay, that's the linearized Navier-Stokes equations. It's not, it's not exactly what we need, the FTQ. We need the H of that, okay, the FTQ. But let's just see, let's just go in two steps. First, I do the DFTQ, and then I say, how do, if we have that one, how do we get the transpose of it, okay? So, the Jacobian is the FTQ. This matrix is generally not accessible. So, we don't form that matrix. All we need is a matrix multiplication with that matrix. So I want to have, a, I'm, I'm totally happy with a routine where I give it a vector, Q, and it gives me back the vector that is multiplied by the Jacobian without ever forming the Jacobian. Okay? So only matrix vector multiplication is necessary. Okay? And the only assumption that I make is, and I should not even mention that, the code should be nice and modular. Okay? Not just one big main code, nice subroutines that separate out the different tasks in your code. Okay. So let me demonstrate how that works, how that technique works on a very simple code example. Okay. So let's say somewhere in our code we have the following snippet. It's a little, little code fragment. Okay. This is one time step, so we go from Q, our field right now at time step T, and this is the decuity T that we have to go into our Rungi Kuta or whatever else time stepper you have. Okay. So this is the flow field. Let's say we take an X derivative. Then we go through a nonlinear subroutine F1. Whatever comes out of the air, we take the Y derivative. And then this piece and the DDX of the first piece go into a subroutine that takes two arguments and is also nonlinear. And that's our Q2. And that's the right-hand side for DQDT. Let's just say... This is a little piece of our code. Could be much more complicated. Okay. All right. So, like I said, I'm going to do two steps. The, the first is the Jacobian, and then I transpose it. Okay. So, if you do the Jacobian, we realize that DDX, DDX is an X derivative. That's a linear operation. Okay. 
So if I, if I, I don't need to linearize that one. It's already linear. Okay? So no linearization here. This is a nonlinear one. That needs to be linearized and that needs to be linearized. But the DDX and the DDY are linear operations. Okay? I don't need to do anything about that. Okay? That's very good because we realize that the DDXs and the DDYs are the operations that link grid points together. Right? They link grid points together. I plus one, I minus one, things like that. Okay, eno, weno, whatever. Uh, but the nonlinearities most likely are local on the grid. Okay? They don't link the grid points together. You very seldom have a nonlinearity that actually is, is one component here and then another component from another grid point. Very, very seldom. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, for example, a reactive term is on the same grid point. Okay? So that's very good. So in order to, to, uh, to, to linearize that one, we do a very simple finite difference approximation where we say F1, and we call that subroutine twice. Once with the part we want to linearize about, and the one with a small epsilon perturbation divided by epsilon, and then this, calling it twice, the same routine, <coughs> is the same as multiplying the E with the Jacobian of that subroutine. Okay? That's the trick. So, by replacing this one, this routine, by a double call with a small epsilon linearized around a Q0. And if Q0 is the same thing all the time, I can do it once and store it away. But I also can do it on the fly. Okay? I can basically replace all the nonlinear parts by their finite difference equivalent. And then my whole block diagram looks like this. Okay? So this was a nonlinear routine. By calling it twice, I linearize it. This is already linear. I linearize this one and I linearize this one. So now if I go through that part here and I patch it together like this, so the A1 is here, then the DDY is here, the A21 is here, A22 is here, you plus it, DDX of Q, then this linearized network is exactly the Jacobian. Okay? So I do automatic differentiation surgically piece by piece that needs it and not the pieces that don't need it. Okay? So if I go through that one, I just did, instead of solving dq dt is f times q, by replacing the, the routine calls by its matrix equivalent, I just linearized my code. Okay? But the linearization is not what we want. We want the transpose of that one, right? So now, Forget about this block diagram. If I transpose this expression here, okay, all together, so I slap an H on top of that one, this is what happens. I get an H on every single piece, plus I revert the order, reverse the order. Okay? That's what transposition of products does. Okay? All right. So this is really what we're after. But now, if you look at this one, you have to read it from right to left. This one basically says, first I have to do A22, then A21, then Y, then, then A1, and then the X at the end. Okay? So what that means is I have to revert the order of my block diagram. I have all these matrices, so transposing them is a piece of cake. Okay? So I just have to run through my code in reverse order and call the transpose of the matrix that I linearized. Okay? That's it. So that means that if you have a, 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 a right-hand side call that consists of calling routine one and then two and then three, for the adjoint, you have to go through and call your routine three first then you're in, in, ad, in, in transpose uh, 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 mode, then you're two, and then you're one. So you run through your code in reverse order with transposing every routine that you have. And that one automatically creates an adjoint time step. Okay? That's very convenient because every time I change my code, the adjoint comes with it. Okay? I add another routine, 
I just add another routine into my block diagram. I don't have to derive anything. I add a reactive module for, for burning gases and so on, and it gets automatically adjointed in the code. We don't derive anymore. We actually take the adjoint of a code in block diagram form. Okay? And we run forward to get the forward solution, and we run through the adjoint code in reverse order to get the adjoint time stepping. So the efficiency, the linearized code and the adjoint code are approximately the same size. There is no, none of this explosion uh, with, that you get with automatic differentiation. Okay. Uh, the matrix extraction step adds only a moderate fraction. Okay. So you have to linearize on the fly. That one is usually done locally. You can store the matrix or you can, it's so cheap, you can, it's not even, don't even bother storing it. You can actually, you know, generate it whenever you need it. Okay, it's so fast. And, uh, and it works really, really well. And your adjoint is up to machine precision. You don't bother with boundary conditions, which usually are the killer in deriving this one. Okay, everything is lumped together. A few extensions. I said differentiation is a linear process, so we never bother the, uh, linearizing our DDX and DDY matrices. Okay, that's not always true. You can act actually have upwinding or Wano, where you have a switch. Which way you go in the stencil, in that case, you have to linearize the switch, but that's no big deal. You can also throw in turbulence models. Okay, and linearize and adjoint the turbulence model. That one works just as well. Spallard Almaraz. Just choose it up, okay? Or compressible flows. Okay, the second thing I wanted to mention about the implementation. So now we know how to get the adjoint. There's one more thing that really can give you a headache. And that is what happens, you know, here is your equation, okay? And that's the forward equation for which you have a code, okay? And let's say F is nonlinear. That's the backward equation, and if f is nonlinear, df dq has a q left. Let's just say it's quadratic. Okay, let's say f is quadratic in q, taking one derivative leaves one q behind. Okay, and if it leaves one q behind, then this one is q dependent. So in order to solve that one, it has a coefficient that depends on q. So what that means is that on the way forward, let, 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 me, let me back up. I also have to, I, I mentioned one, one key ingredient. Uh, I, I, I uh, didn't mention one key ingredient. This is a forward integration. So we start with time zero and we start forward up to time large t, okay? The adjoint equation actually is solved backwards in time from capital P, T back to zero, okay? All right, so with this one thrown in, in order to do the reverse integration from t to zero, I will need all the q's that I actually calculated on the forward problem because I need it for these coefficients, okay? So suddenly, these two things are not independent of each other. I can integrate the first problem all by itself. I don't need to store anything, but on the way back, if f is nonlinear, I need the forward flow fields to inject into the coefficients for the backward integration of the adjoint. Okay, so that one is a little bit of a of a of a, uh, a bad thing. So there is no free lunch. So how do we do that? Let's do two cases. The first case is I have infinite storage. Okay, so I can actually afford storing all that. So this is so usually the diagram that you get. So let me just orient you. This is the time we're going to integrate. We integrate from zero up here. So it's, time is not going this way. It's actually going down. Okay. Time is equal to zero here to capital T here. Okay. And this is, times, uh, this is the initial condition, time step one, time step two, time step three, four, five, and so on. Okay. And what I note here is the total number of time steps I take independent of whether I go forward or backward. So I chuck along here, okay? And I store all the flow fields. Every time step is stored away, I have infinite storage, okay? Until I get to T. 
And then I'm at t. Now I have to take the adjoint and go backwards to zero. Okay. So as I turn around and go back up to zero, so that's the reverse integration back to zero. Okay. I need for the next time step, I need that flow field that I stored one before. Okay. So I inject that one here, and then I can solve my adjoint equation. And I do the next one. And the next one, and then by the time I'm up here, I injected back all my equa all my flow fields to do my backward integration. So going down and going up, this is the total number of steps. It's twice for each direction. Okay, that's when you can afford to store everything. But usually only for small problems that works. For large problems, we cannot. So let's do a second one where we actually store only a few of those, okay? So here is, here's, the, here's the way we do that. Let's say we only have memory to store six flow fields, okay? Just six, but we're integrating much, much, much longer than six flow fields, okay? So here is what we do. We store the initial condition, then we integrate away without storing, and then next time we store is already here. Then the next one is here. And then when we see, oops, we're coming to the end of it, then we store everything on that last little piece. Okay? So then on the way back, we do it exactly like we do. We have everything we need until we come to here. And then the next steps, oops, we don't have anything. Okay? So in that case, what you do is you stop you stop your adjoint integration, you use this as an initial condition, you throw this one out, you clear up your memory, and then you start here again to do another forward sweep to fill in the ones that you didn't store. Okay? So you do a little bit of extra work, you take this one, you fill it in, okay? the one that you skipped before, and then you can go further on with your adjoint. Then you come to here, is something missing? You play the same thing again. You're gonna take this one, you regenerate this one, then you can keep on going, then you regenerate this one from your checkpoints, okay? And that's called checkpointing, okay? So you have to do extra work, so you pay in time what you cannot store. If you could store everything, there would be just as many, uh, you, you, have, you, have, you, you have no extra work, right? Everything is there. But in this case, you actually buy yourself uh, storage by doing the extra work. So now the extra work is much, not much longer, but, but it's 50% longer than it was before, and you have to do this extra work. Now, this was not a very smart choice of checkpoints. Why? Because in the beginning, I said I have storage for six, okay? So I stored six, so now my, my, my storage is up to the rim. And then on the second one, when I'm here, I have this one stored and this one stored. I only have five, five active checkpoints stored, okay? And then when I'm in this thing, I only have one, two, three, four, and here I have one, two, three. So I'm not really using my memory optimally because when I only store three, I could store three more and they're empty, okay? So this was not a good distribution of checkpoints. A better way is, is distributing it so that in the beginning you skip longer and then towards the end you skip a little shorter. And there's an optimal distribution where you always have your six memory slots full all the time, no matter where you are. Okay, and that one is called binomial checkpointing or minimal repetition dynamic checkpointing. Okay, but you get the idea. All right, now, special cases. Okay. This, is, this, is the, this is about as general as it gets. I have not said anything. I have not made any restrictions, anything. Okay, this works for everything. Uh, uh, but how about special cases? and maybe even familiar cases. Okay. So let's say we have an LTI system, and I think Scott will talk about that one or afterwards. Okay. So we have a linear time invariant system. So my F is not as complicated as you can make it. F is actually quite, quite, um, quite nice. Okay. 
And also, we're going to look at gains. Okay, so this is case number one. My governing equation is q dot is equal to l times q, and l is constant coefficient <coughs> in time. It's a linear time invariant system. Okay, and let's say my objective is my my what what I want to maximize is the perturbation in some kind of measure. Okay, energy for example, kinetic energy. My perturbation after time t divided by how I started out with. Okay, so that's the overall gain in energy. And I want to maximize that. I want to see how bad it can possibly get. My control variable to play around with is the initial condition. Okay, so I play with my initial condition to make that ratio as big as I can subject to this evolution equation. Okay, so that's a very special case of that general optimization thing. 